Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Canada School of Public Service, to uh, our new series that we are launching in uh, partnership with uh, our friends at the Centre for International Governance Innovation in Waterloo, Ontario. My name is Teki Sarantakis. Je suis la présidente de l'école. Quel temps de participer et de penser et de, de, de parler concernant les, les nouveaux économies? The historian Yovel Harari has said that pandemics and public emergencies push the fast forward button on history. And uh, we can see that today. We can see that things that would probably have taken years, if not decades, to happen are happening in moments and sometimes in days. And things that uh, change slowly are now changing rapidly. We talk about change a lot in the government of Canada, but change is something that's always been with us. What really is distinctive about change today is the rapidity with which change happens, especially in a connected world. And when you have a connected world, whether that's connected through, um, through broadband, through supply chains, through population movements, Things that used to take a long time now happen really, really rapidly. So the environment with, it, with which you, as civil servants within the Government of Canada, operate uh, changes around you to an extent that has never been the case for your predecessors. To the extent that you're lucky, you're lucky that your successors will have to operate even faster than you do, believe it or not. But this is the slowest that change will ever be in your lifetime. So we have over 1,100 people registered with us today watching online to talk about the new economy. I think that speaks to a hunger and a thirst for understanding what is going on around the world around us. What is it that's going on around us? So many things are happening. One of the things that's happening is that new giants are emerging almost daily and taking over institutions and companies that uh, have been with us and our parents and our grandparents for generations. Tesla, which was born in 2003, 2003. Many, many of you were already in the government of Canada in 2003. I know I was. Which was born in 2003 has a market value that exceeds General Motors. It exceeds the market value of Ford. In fact, it exceeds the market value of both of them combined. And Tesla obviously isn't even the only digital giant. Facebook was born in 2004. Facebook now has something in the order of 3 billion users. Imagine that. Imagine something that was born in 2004 has connected about a third of the planet. And it's going more. It's adding every day. Google was born in 1998. Google today sells more ads than ABC, NBC, and CBS combined. The three networks of our lifetime that we were all growing up and, you know, remember the Super Bowl and it would cost a, a million dollars a minute to advertise on the Super Bowl. Well, Google now sells more ads than all three of those television stations combined. And Amazon. Amazon is the old man of this epoch. Amazon was born in 1994. And Amazon now is running supply chains and web links and clouds uh, all over the world. And it was born in 1994. And if you think that this is just an international um, phenomenon, think again. Shopify is now the largest company in Canada by market valuation. It exceeds the market valuation of Imperial Oil, of the Royal Bank of Canada, of the Bank of Montreal, of banks and institutions that have been around for over a century. And it just started a little while ago. And now it's more valuable than they are. Did they discover gold? Did they discover platinum? Did they discover diamonds? No. What they discovered, what all of these companies discovered, were ideas. And ideas, or intellectual property, is the new currency of the modern economy. And something that we, comme fonctionnaires au sein du gouvernement de Canada, doivent comprendre. Il est notre responsabilité d'avoir une connaissance 
de ces aspects de nova, nouvelle économie. As I said, we're joined today with uh, our friends from CG, and I'm very pleased to introduce uh, its president, Rohinton Medora, who will introduce, uh, who will give us a few words about CG. Rohinton. Thank you. Thank you so much. And hello, everyone. It's a pleasure for us at CG to be connecting with the Canada School and all of you in the uh, civil service uh, on this important subject uh, through a series of lectures. And so let me compliment what Taiki said in a couple of minutes by making these points. The first one, which, which uh, we all know and Taiki underlined, is that the digital era, whether it's about intangibles, data, IP, digital, there's a sort of nexus of issues around that, which isn't just any trend, but a defining trend. Uh, it permeates absolutely every part of our life, economic, non-economic, and therefore um, is a condition for effective public action, which is where the civil service and all of us come in. Uh, in uh, this series of lectures, I hope you find a number of things. I mean, there's a number of insights that will come out, and um, in this opening lecture, many of them will. Uh, two or three broad generalizations about that. One, I think you will see that the, the distinction that we've sometimes made between international and domestic goes away. When you want to regulate or tax multinational digital platforms. Is that domestic policy or is it international policy? When you hear about data flows and data localization, is that domestic policy or is it international? And so there's a series of these issues and this bleeding in and out in which uh, political borders barely matter, although geopolitics does, is something I think is striking. The second is the distinctions that we make sectorally between the economy, between health, personal security, human rights, and on and on. Again, think of the current situation we're in. You can use cellular technology for epidemiological purposes, but it also raises privacy, economic, and other concerns. Why think about them separately when in reality they have to be taken all together? And so throughout this lecture, we'll be um, touching on subjects like trade, investment, competition policy, the importance of standards, cybersecurity, intellectual property, indeed mental health, and a series of issues to do with public health more broadly. And so um, I will uh, turn it back to you by simply saying, this is something that's going to be with us, Taiki, for a good long time. And it's imperative for us as citizens, but especially as officials, to understand the analytical base, because this is all evidence-driven, and then decide for ourselves what the policy implications for Canada might be. So thank you again, and back to you. Merci, Rohinton. Uh, for those of you who uh, aren't familiar with CJ, with CG, this is a really good opportunity for you to maybe uh, poke around a little bit on their website. Uh, they do some groundbreaking stuff in uh, the new world of the economy. And again, it is as a resource society, as a resource country historically, we've been very blessed. But the world uh, in 2020 and beyond, while resources will always be important, ideas more and more are driving the world. And uh, we're very blessed to have a think tank that uh, is a Canadian think tank that's putting a particular domestic focus on uh, issues that are international. Notre premier invité uh, s'appelle Bob Fay. And Bob is the Director of Research uh, for the Digital Economy at CG. Bob, like Rohinton before him, uh, is a friend of the public service, having worked in um, the public service, uh, including as a special assistant to Governor Mark Carney, uh, another great Canadian who has done wonderful things on the international stage. Uh, our second uh, uh, in, uh, our second, I'm speaking French in my brain, notre deuxième invité uh, s'appelle Dan Curiac, uh, who is a senior fellow at CG, uh, and he also had uh, an illustrious career in the Government of Canada after about 30 years 
he retired as the Deputy Chief Economist at uh, Global Affairs Canada. Uh, après avoir fini la présentation, uh, on, on invite vos questions uh, et vos commentaires. Uh, avec ça, je donne la parole uh, à Bob et Dan uh, afin de commencer. Gentlemen. Okay, thanks, Saki. Uh, Dan, I'm just going to get the presentation queued up. Okay, doke. Very good. So let me jump in here now. So we want to talk today about the intangibles economy. Um, and we'll start by talking about intangible assets. We've actually uh, long talked about the intangibles economy in terms of, of services. The services are intangibles. However, where services are intangible products, today we want to focus on intangible assets. We've also talked for a long time about a knowledge-based economy. So these are the assets that underpin this knowledge-based economy. In this economy, a company's knowledge assets uh, include uh, its technology, its specific human capital, its organizational capital. And these are combined to give a company the competitive edge to create quality products that could command a premium price and withstand competition from the low-wage economies that have been bursting on the scene over the last few decades, in particular, the East Asian tiger economies. So policy for this economy focused on the inputs, research and development. We supported R&D spending, investment in information technology and software, education focused on STEM uh, skills to provide the person power. And in a tandem with other advanced economies, Canada increased the scope and intensity of protection for intellectual property. So in recent years now, an additional form of intangible asset, productive asset, has become very important, and that is data. And data is generated by the myriad daily routines of digitally connected individuals and machines. These ubiquitous devices capture data uh, they include not only computers and smartphones connected to the internet and social media platforms, but also fitness trackers, security cameras and buildings and surveillance satellites, sensors and pipelines, chips and smart equipment of all so sorts, uh, from cars to tractors to refrigerators. So with the spread of these devices, we have basically identified pretty much to any aspect of economic activity. Uh, with ubiquitous modeling, it's only a modest exaggeration to say if it's move, if it, if it moves, it's measured. And it's the story now data is being accumulated in amounts that are truly um, astronomical. So the importance of data is uh, accumulation. Uh, data has been accumulated into vast stores, and that's what makes it valuable. In prior ages, when land was a decentral asset, a country's wealth and power depended on its holdings of arable and well-watered land. Wars were fought for acquisition of land. With the Industrial Revolution, mass production machines an essential asset, and it, the wealth and power in the Industrial Age went to the countries that accumulated the capital equipment machinery. Um, with the knowledge-based economy, that became those that accumulated protected IP. And you see the, the, the uh, power and wealth shifts from, okay, the screen is frozen for me there, but I'll continue. So intellectual property uh, or an economy which is based on intangible assets behaves very differently from one which is based upon physical assets. An intangible economy has a surprising number of characteristics which differentiate from this traditional industrial economy. Uh, for example, ownership. In the world of, in, of tangible uh, assets, ownership is an exclusive positive right. In the world of intangibles, which have public characteristics, ownership depends on denying access to others. It's a negative right. The source of income in the world of tangibles comes from mass production and, and expansion of market share. But in intangibles comes from capture of owner and selling its goods but in moving inventory. But in the world of intangibles, the objective is to amass a war chest of IP that can be uh, 
or supporting its own production. Payments to these, only one person can use a cell phone at a time, there, but IP is non-rivalrous. There is no limit to how many people can use one, a product at the same time when it's intangible. It changes the dynamics of, of the login completely. Goods, uh, these have to move through the conventional backbone infrastructure of an economy, which means that production is rooted in the sense it, 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 it is done where the infrastructure is. That's one reason why the expensive economies, which have got a world-class infrastructure like Germany, can compete with low-wage economies. But with IP, it can be located anywhere. Today, it could be in the U.S., tomorrow in Ireland. Indeed, it's located where the tax benefits are. The shift of U.S. IP to Ireland at one point in response to a tax change resulted in a massive one-year surge of Irish GDP. Not that the Irish felt this, but certainly its economy did in a measured sense. So in terms of the, in, in a tangible world, the search for efficiency uh, in goods production generates global value change with spread wealth. But IP is based on winner-take most e economics. Once the IP is produced, there are no more wages to be paid, just rents to be collected. So again, the, uh, it's a, uh, the knowledge-based economy concentrates wealth where the industrial economy spread wealth. The, by its very nature, the industrial economy that, that uh, existed in the post-war era was a highly competitive one, and competition policy aimed to prevent its concentration and development of monopolies. But with the intangibles economy, the aim is actually the opposite, is to cre create and enforce a temporary monopoly. Again, in the traditional economy, trade agreements increase competition. Uh, they actually eroded the value of vested interest in, in that economy. But in the intangibles economy, trade agreements work to prevent competition. They restrict it. They protect the IP. In this sense, modern trade agreements are asset value protection agreements, and they protect the, the value of vested interests. So uh, let's move on to the next uh, uh, slide. So just how valuable are these intangible assets? Well, in the most advanced uh, knowledge-based economy, which is the United States, uh, intangible assets now account for over 90% of the S&P 500. Uh, that's huge. Back in the 1970s, it was on the order of 20 or 30 percent. That shows the, the enormous expansion of the value of, of assets. I, I think uh, Taki was mentioning the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the massive market capitalization of some of these companies. Well, uh, when we did this measurement, uh, the, the leading FANG companies had a market cap on mm -hmm. assets is that we have not invested in them. Uh, so, comparatively speaking, Canada is an intangible asset poor country. And to understand the significance of this strategy uh, for us, it's useful to think of the game of Monopoly. So, the way that Canada plays this game is we go around the Monopoly board, we collect our uh, $200 a go, and we pay rents to the owners of assets. Hey, Dan, it's uh, Bob Bob here. Uh, to use a Star Trek analogy, you're breaking up. Um, I'm not sure if we can do anything on um, your end. Just Bob, would you mind taking over, please? Because uh, we've uh, uh, Dan's broadband isn't working. I what? Okay. Oh, sorry, are you there, Dan? Okay, go ahead, Dan. Uh, so I guess I'm not coming through. Okay, well, why don't I take over for a minute, and we'll see. Oh, Daniel. So, um, am I coming through now? Yeah, you are. So let's let's try. Okay, so I'll continue. So again. Canada was not investing in this economy and with regard to artificial intelligence, which is now the most important um, asset in the pipeline, we actually are one of the few countries which have not been uh, increasing our investment and our patenting activity in that sphere. So 
Moving on to the the uh, the data driven economy, this is a really um, interesting economy in terms of just how prone it is to market failure. So it features powerful economies of scale. Uh, uh, think about here Google's gleaming server banks. It's one thing to have data, but to acquire the amount of data that Google has, which is then uh, drives the quality of its predictions um, and which drives the quality of its artificial intelligence expertise, it needs a lot of infrastructure to accumulate that. So th this is a game that goes to the big. Think of economies of scope here. Uh, sharing data across applications in multi-production and multi-product firms allows the, the different forms of data to be cross-referenced against each, each other, which makes each type more valuable. Here, a good uh, uh, so, uh, idea to have in mind is that of Facebook. It, it already had an enormous amount of information on its client base, but it was after the financial information because th that financial information cross-referenced with everything else it had made all of its data more powerful. This economy also features knowledge externalities. And here there's an interesting distinction to be drawn between global and local externalities. With datafication, uh, global players have access to local knowledge externalities. This enables Google to compete at the local level for sales and advertising. Um, traditionally, global companies could only exploit the global knowledge externalities. So the data-driven economy is different. This is what enables, for example, an alphabet to come into Sidewalk uh, with the Sidewalk project in Toronto and hoover up that very local data and actually then dominate that economy. So typically that was not the case previously. Then we have network externalities, and these are classic. One person uh, has a phone, it's useless. Two people have a phone, now it's useful. The more our members to the, to the network, the, the better it is. This is a huge positive feedback loop. In markets like which are typical in uh, the internet world, which are two-sided markets where you have, uh, on, on one side you've got a user base generating information, on the other side, you've got the, the sale of advertising or something else to target that population. These, these type of network externalities tend to tip uh, the market towards one dominant player. And that's what we see, for example, with the Facebook. And then we have pervasive information asymmetries. Uh, here, the business model of, of the data-driven companies is to exploit information asymmetry to improve their terms of trade, one might say. Think of it in, in this form. If you understand everything about a client, you can price uh, your product to the point where that customer is willing to pay. So price discrimination becomes a, a, a major feature of, the, uh, of, of, of this economy. And what it does do is it shifts consumer surplus to producer surplus. That's how these data-driven uh, companies become so wealthy. Data in, uh, is also like an industrial sense, a, a strength sixth sense that provides a data-rich company an evolutionary advantage in, um, in competing with other firms, and that also tends to drive it towards market dominance. So in this sense, I, I, I tend to call information asymmetry the original sin of the data-driven economy. And finally, to top it off, this particular economy, because it deals with intangible products, uh, which can be circulated over the internet uh, with uh, almost no friction and no cost, this creates machine knowledge capital uh, which, uh, unlike human capital, is embodied, or machine capital, which is embodied, say, in a robot, this actually is, a, this kind of AI has zero marginal cost, and it can be circulated around the world costlessly. So once you've got the best uh, AI out there, you become the superstar firm. So any one of these particular features would drive market failure. Together, they make the data-driven economy unusually predisposed to market failure and concentration, and that's certainly what we've seen. So let's move on to the smile curve. And this particular curve illustrates, um, I think, graphically where Canada is in this economy and where we perhaps might want to go. So. In, this, this is a familiar cur uh, 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 curve from, from the uh, knowledge-based economy era. And what it showed was that uh, you had the, the traditional production of, of goods and services and uh, standardized services 
was actually at the bottom of the curve, and all the value uh, came from the um, the ownership of the intellectual property and R and D at the front end, and then at, mar at uh, 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 trademarks and, and, and marketing at the other end. Now, in this particular world, uh, the producers of, of, of goods and services, all of this tended to be outsourced to the low-cost countries, to the low-wage countries. This was the origin of global value chains, while the wealthy and knowledge-based economies congregated at the, the, uh, up the two slopes of the curve. In the data-driven economy, we have the same sort of a curve now, but it's actually probably even more, uh, more pronounced. At the bottom of this curve, what we see is the the grunt work of, of developing data applications, of developing artificial intelligence, uh, data categorization, coding, exploring this world. This is the world of startups. And up at the front, at, up at the two ends, what you have is the ownership of the IP, which this production work generates. And there, the issue lies with enforcement of ownership of, of the AI, um, of the IP. And here you get into litigation strategies and freedom to operate. And at the other end of it, you've got the monetization of, of the uh, artificial intelligence and the data. And these are the uh, things such as selling advertising, for example. So we're Canada's position right now. We're at the bottom of this curve. We, we have got the, uh, the assets to produce, the, the human capital assets to produce artificial intelligence. We're great as startups, but we do not accumulate the IP and the intangible assets. And this was the whole issue which played itself out with Sidewalk Toronto. So a final observation I would make then is that in terms of the, the dynamics that we've seen uh, in, in, with populism and, and the emergence of, of political uh, uh, sort of conflict within countries, it, it, when, when, when this uh, curve was uh, applied to the industrial economy, what happened was that the manufacturing jobs were good jobs as long as there was rent. Once you get into the, into the uh, latter stages of the industrial economy, all those rents were squeezed out, they were competitive, there was no longer uh, a good job. They, they were outsourced to China and so forth, but in point of fact, it was the squeezing out of the rents which, which, uh, uh, which eroded that particular middle class good job economy. Today, that remains the case and where wealth and power and uh, prosperity lie are on the two slopes of that curve and that's where Canada wants to move. So Bob, I'll turn it over to you. Hopefully that came through reasonably well. Okay, yeah, thank you, Dan. Um, so, um, so first I'd like to say that my remarks are drawing upon material that's actually been produced by a lot of our uh, research fellows, including people like Dan, and they're, they're high level. I'm gonna cover a lot of topics rather quickly, but we do have uh, plans to go into more depth on them in subsequent lectures. So the first point is the pandemic has obviously revealed to us just how important the intangibles economy is to all of us. We've used digital technologies such as Facebook and Google and Amazon to keep in contact, to shop, to work, to educate our kids, and of course to find out information about COVID. We've seen how these technologies have permeated all aspects of our lives and the enormous benefits that they bring. And these technologies are all based on intangibles, research and development, software, brand recognition, copyrights, trademarks, patent, patents, and trade secrets, and very importantly, the data that drives them. We've also seen how these technologies have changed the nature of work in the workplace, but we've also seen that not all people have the skills to use them effectively. We've seen safety net gaps, and we've seen how they, these uh, affect some groups more than others, and in fact, we've seen the digital divide in action. Um, so, but we've also seen new dependencies that have been created, supply chains, access to reliable digital infrastructure, as we've just witnessed, broadband, and the need for accurate information. And this, of course, has taken place against the longer-term rise of automation, monopoly power, and inequality. So with that background, you know, what has COVID-19 raised beyond that? Well, obviously, as I've just discussed, digital infrastructure accessibility and resilience. And importantly, uh, access to trusted information. 
We've seen the value in trusted information, for example, that given by our public health officers. And technology can get information to people at scale. But it also allows misinformation and disinformation at scale. And we've seen this. We've seen the spread of disinformation, fake cures. We've seen opinion spread as fact. And, of course, we've seen cyber attacks on hospitals and ransomware and others. It's also revealed the importance of the ownership of IP, intellectual property. We know that IP is important to stimulate investment in risky technologies and their diffusion, but it can also hold up diffusion too. And in this case, we've seen the need for sharing of information for vaccine development, for 3D printing of uh, personal protective equipment. We've seen calls for patent pools and compulsory licensing. And in, in fact, Canada has implemented uh, a COVID-19 Emergency Response Act to allow for compulsory patent licensing to the extent necessary for a vaccine. I think we've also had a glimpse of the future workplace. And to what extent will the tools that we've used during COVID-19 become the, work, the norm for work or for education? And what would that imply for education, for training, for our workplace setup, for, for the safety net, and whether it's equipped for such changes? And we've also seen uh, issues related to privacy, security, and surveillance. So for example, do you know what is happening with the data each and every time you use an app and each time you use a social media platform? Do you know what you've consented to? How your data are being monetized to micro-target you and others with good and bad information to surveil you and various aspects of your lives? And how could such data be used by employers, by government, by platforms? And do you know that your engagement with large social media platforms help to cement their monopoly, monopoly positions as they capture more and more data. And you know that they are generally self-regulated, if, if regulated at all, nationally and globally. And this leads to the point on governance. At this point, governance of the digital economy is incomplete, fragmented, and in some areas non-existent. And this has important implications not only for Canadians and their use of technology, but also Canada's ability to thrive in the IP-driven world. So, are these changes we've seen related to COVID a new normal or not? If behavior changes fundamentally, then our existing policies, regulations, and laws may not be suitable or adequate. And this, of course, is also taking place against a very challenging uh, global environment. And COVID has brought to the forefront some of the international dependencies and trade barriers, like in agriculture and in PPE, and concerns about supply chains, whether they need to be reoriented, and then if, if so, what are the implications for prices and welfare? COVID has highlighted some of the intangible issues related to trade, for example, dominance in intellectual property in a data-driven economy, which is ultimately what is behind China-US trade disputes. And then there, the collection, control, and use of data as it crosses borders also raises a variety of privacy, competition, trade, and national security concerns. Now, some of the issues about globalization that we, we've heard over the last uh, decade are actually issues related to the safety net and equipping workers for the new opportunities provided by globalization, and this is likely to intensify. And then the final point is not one that's gotten a lot of discussion, but the global safety net. Uh, and, and this is how less developed countries are going to be challenged in this environment. They will require assistance for the pandemic, and they'll require assistance with rising debt. Data and intangibles can be used to improve the safety net through cheaper financial services, improve policies and targeting of services, new development opportunities, but only if we get the governance right. If not, the intangibles economy could be a barrier for them instead. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here because I know, uh, you know, people listening, you, you've experienced how these issues just cut across the public service. We, you know, with COVID-19, we've seen how the government, uh, in attempts to get PPE, have had to deal with trade issues, protectionist measures, patent issues, for example, related to 3D printing, and agile procurement. We've seen how the imperative of public health measures has required supportive policies uh, in a number of areas, health policy, economic policy, trade policy, social and labor market policies, industrial policy, 
national security, public safety, and so on. This is the new norm. And of course, it all requires uh, substantial policy coordination, and perhaps in ways that, uh, that we're not used to. Um, so not only has horizontal coordination been required uh, in the example I just gave, but it's also required uh, um, with respect to coordination with other agencies that have created complementary policies within their mandates, such as the Bank of Canada and CMHC. It's required consultation across levels of government. For, government, for example, the provinces have uh, complemented federal government efforts in many areas. And it's required substantial stakeholder input. As various measures have been announced, feedback from stakeholders has helped to ensure that the benefits uh, reach the intended recipients. And it also helped to identify gaps that needed to be filled. So looking forward, uh, this, this post-COVID world, policy will, uh, not surprisingly from our perspective, require an even greater focus on the data-driven economy and longer-term growth, uh, you know, taking into account the, uh, the issues that Dan has already raised. So what we've seen in the pandemic is, you know, policy has been made fast and flexibly, and that's been appropriate for the circumstances, but of course it's not appropriate to meet the longer-term goals of boosting our living standards. We need to keep this agility so that policy and regulation adapts to the data-driven economy, but as well outlined in Canada's Innovation Skills Plan, uh, we have a productivity problem in our country and focus needs to be uh, based in improving productivity growth. So what might that look like? The first point is more of a general point uh, that I've made in other commentary that we need to keep our stimulus measures in place and not pull back too early or we risk uh, permanent damage to our economy. And we can come back to that in the Q&A if people have questions. Uh, let's focus on the next, uh, the, next few bullet, uh, the next few points in the circle, which is the, what I call the drivers of growth, human capital investment, investment in intangibles and tangibles, and how we use them together. We know that some firms and sectors will change fundamentally, and some firms will not survive. And this will happen against the background of broader structural change as we continue our shift towards the, in the data-driven economy. We've seen the rise of new digital industries. We've seen existing industries transformed by data and digitalization, and we've seen others shrink in size. We need better diffusion of these technologies and new tools to do the job effectively, which I've coined data analytics. Data and how we manage and use it is a key strategic ass uh, uh, asset and will lead to new products, services, and processes. But as with any technological change, this will require assistance of people to move into new opportunities, including changes to our education and training systems and suitable uh, active labor market programs. And as Dan has highlighted in some of his other work for CG, we need to rethink industrial policy, something that I remember you know, 15 years ago when I was working at the Bank of Canada, talking to Industry Canada at the time, you really couldn't even mention the, uh, those terms. But the data-driven economy with its market failures means that an activist industrial policy is required in some areas. And for example, uh, you know, one initiative by the federal government are the super clusters. We also know that growth needs to be inclusive. Not only have we seen what happens when it isn't, anti-immigration, rise in populism, Inclusion is essential for growth. So as we adapt to COVID and as behavior changes, evidence-based policies will become an even more important guide to policy. We've seen the reliance on technical expertise uh, as health and uh, economic policy were formulated during the crisis, and we've seen the need for trusted data in particular. And this is something our statistical agency, Statistics Canada, is well equipped to do. Accurate and understandable data is essential to it being used correctly for policy. And then finally, I have opportunities that meet up multiple objectives. I'll just throw in one example right now, and that's uh, clean technology. Uh, and uh, we also need to focus on governance. And governance is one of those things we take for granted, especially in Canada where we have good governance structures. Governance is essentially the frameworks that guide us in our actions, it includes our laws, our regulations, standards, principles, social norms. 
And uh, it's important because good governance promotes innovation and good growth. And there are clear gaps in the data-driven economy. We need appropriate governance that takes into account the differences between personal and non-personal data, how they may be combined with advanced analytics, uh, such as those behind our digital uh, platforms, and while taking into account national security and cybersecurity con uh, considerations. Governance is essential to unlock data and its value. It's an extremely valuable resource. Statistics Canada released experimental estimates a year ago that on the high end place it at over $200 billion Canadian, and I think that's likely an underestimate. And the amount of data is going to explode with the Internet of Things and 5G. So to fully reap the benefits of big data, we need proper governance and trust that uh, that governance can bring. And that's the next point, is trust. Um, I'm sure you've heard it often. Uh, governance builds trust in our institutions. It builds trust in the government. It builds trust in firms and all those that use the information about us. And trust is an essential element of the intangibles economy. It's an element of social capital. We need to know, we need to have trust um, that firms and people sharing our data, we need to have, trust is essential um, to firms and the people sharing our data. We need to trust that the data, we need to trust uh, that, we need to trust the data and how it's being used. And if we don't trust how the data are being used, well, that may uh, lower trust in our institutions themselves, including government or our social media platforms. And part of trust is transparency in how uh, technology is being used. So um, this is a big slide, and I hope, I hope you've had an opportunity to look at it. Um, I, I don't plan to go through it in detail, uh, but I think one of the main points here is I, it may be surprising just how cross-cutting data governance is. It, uh, we've divided it up into five areas. And they're not mutually exclusive, for example, when you look at data property rights and cybersecurity. What I thought I would do is to give you an example. And that example is something very topical, and that's digital contact tracing. And I'm going to make uh, three heroic assumptions uh, with the technology. First, um, that it works as intended, that it accurately identifies those at risk, and that sufficient people sign up for whatever the app might be. But even then, even if all those three things were true, there's some profound issues around the collection of personal data. So starting with data property rights, what rules are there about how contact tracing data would be collected, stored, cleaned, used, anonymized, transferred, transformed, or destroyed? And if you consent, what if you want to withdraw consent? How, how would that work? Who should make these rules and enforce them? The um, Office of the Privacy Commissioner has put out uh, a framework in this area, but I think the OPC has also recognized that legislation around privacy is not up to the task of the digital age. Global governance. Who should make the international governance rules for apps, especially if the data go across borders, which is likely to be the case? How could we ensure that the data respect our legislation, such as PIPIDA? Social good. What else might be revealed via contact tracing? Might it reveal something about your physical or mental health? And would you want that shared? Should we allow data to be stored by gender, age, and race to help evidence-based research? Or could this lead to racial and other types of profiling, particularly if the data are not destroyed after the pandemic? With cyber, do people fully understand the right cyber risks associated with the use of an app? Will they un unknowingly give away important information about themselves or about others? And then finally, clearly um, the, the contact tracing data is extremely valuable. It has, uh, and, and commercially, um, and you know, it could help improve vastly healthcare delivery and outcomes. But of course, it would be even more valuable to social media platforms that could use it to enrich their data troves, which enhances their market position. Now, line behind uh, data governance is, in fact, a host of trade and geopolitical issues that, that we actually do see being played out on the, on the world stage right now. Starting from the left, we have the USA, 
where open data flows get enshrined in trade agreements, such as uh, USMCA or KUZMA as we call it, and force the data to flow back to their de facto national champions that are lightly regulated and which reinforces their market power. We have the EU data realm, which doesn't have national champions, but instead focuses on strategic regulations to rein in the market power of platforms and promote individual rights through its general da uh, data protection regulation. We have China and its great firewall with full data localization and a massive database of its citizens that can be used to create national champions. And this is broadly consistent with its Made in China uh, 2020 initiative to, to become a more innovative economy. And as part of that, it's also trying to become a leading standard setter, which allows it to embed its technology in a standard and disseminate its values globally through the standard, which it is doing right now through Belt and Road and by its dominance in standards for facial recognition. And these and other issues have all become flashpoints, particularly with the United States, as uh, what I referred to before, the underlying issues in, in their trade disputes. So where does Canada fit in? Well, we're subject to both US rules via our recent trade agreement and to the EU via GDPR and we're impacted by what China does via their own developments in technology, via their influence in standard setting, via the geopolitical tensions that have emanated from their global rise, uh, via their um, uh, implicit standard setting via Belt and Road, and so on. So what does all this mean? How do we build this prosperous economy that, uh, that, that we want for ourselves and, uh, and for our children? I'm going to focus on the right-hand side uh, of this chart. Um, and in fact, um, there are a lot of initiatives going on both in Canada and globally in all of these areas. Um, so I'll just make three points here. So using data governance, uh, data governance lens as a focus, uh, Canada needs to continue to review and update legislation and regulation on privacy, cyber, competition, and national security. We need to identify gaps and linkages and address them in an integrated way. Governance is a strategic advantage for Canada. We need to set standards for the big data value chain, for data, for the artificial intelligence uh, algorithms, and the platforms that use them, and tackle associated issues such as bias and the ethical use of these technologies, surveillance, capitalism, and, and others. We need to build upon the efforts already underway, such as the Government of Canada Directive on Automated Processing, and incorporate the many initiatives that are underway uh, here and elsewhere. We need a strategic focus on standards and embed our values and our technology into standards and export them to the world. This is an essential element of our competitive framework and, compl and complements regulation and legislation that typically lag. And we need to think of different types of governance arrangements from open data, which the government always do, already is doing with its public data, to data trusts and collaboratives, and the underlying principles and legal and regulatory structures that are more suitable to different uh, types of data. And we need new international rules of the game for data, trade, foreign direct investment, intellectual property, and we need rules that don't in favor lar that don't favor large uh, incumbents. As Dan has noted in his work, data are not trade ready. So, for example, in recent testimony to the House of, to the House Committee on International Trade, I indicated how trade commitments made in uh, Kuzma related to data and intellectual property have very wide-ranging repercussions in many forward-looking areas, including our ability to harness data in new technologies such as AI as well as fundamental domestic policies related to privacy, security, intellectual property, investment, competition, and innovation. So Canada could push to have a full-fledged WTO negotiation round to tackle this issue, and Canada could also push for the creation of a new global organization to set international governance for the data-driven economy, something we've called a, a digital stability board. Now, Canada has a framework in place, and it's called the Digital Charter, and hopefully you're familiar with that. Um, I think here, um, what I would say is that governance for the intangibles economy represents both an enormous opportunity and an imperative for Canada. We're not part of the data realms that I just discussed, and in fact, nor are most countries, uh, even though we are affected by those realms. 
we need to chart our own way, and that path is one that other countries may want to follow as well. Finally, um, I, I took this from the mandate letter to Minister Baines, and uh, and I thought the, the letters uh, and the, I, that were also issued to justice and and um, and to culture, heritage and culture, um, were were very indicative, because what they point what they emphasize is the importance of putting in place rights around the online or what we refer to as the data-driven economy. The letter recognizes that it requires substantial coordination across departments. And I think it hopefully it's clear that the efforts and coordination actually go well beyond what is listed here. And these are some of our publications uh, that you can find our recent work and the work we've done in the past uh, related to data governance. So thank you very much, and uh, I think I'm going to pass the floor back to Taiki now. Thank you very much, gentlemen. So um, the tremendous presentation, tremendous themes uh, of the utmost importance for uh, Canada's public service and for the people that are watching us uh, and listening today. And as we noted, this is the first of uh, a series. So I know we touched on a lot today, uh, data, privacy, connectivity, domestic, international, uh, intellectual property, uh, all of those things we will be talking about in uh, greater detail going forward throughout the series, but that was a wonderful, wonderful introduction. So I want to start a little bit. Um, the first theme I want to poke a little bit uh, with you is, Dan, you talked a little bit uh, about the, the winner takes most uh, economy, and that's something that this is one of the first times in history, if not the first time in history, that we're seeing this. And, uh, you know, in the past, if you were kind of like number two or number three or number four in a particular industry or a particular sector, you could make a nice living. If you were Pepsi to Coca-Cola or if you were, you know, Chrysler or Ford to General Motors or Labatt's to Molson, uh, you could make a nice living. But now if you look at the world and kind of the emerging platforms that are that have established themselves uh, very suddenly and very forcefully almost without us even noticing it, something really interesting is happening. So kind of Facebook is number one in social networking. YouTube is number one in video sharing. Kind of who's number two? Google is number one in search engines. Who's number two? Airbnb is number one in property sharing. Who's number two? Amazon is number one in on online shopping. Who's number two? The answer for all of those is the same. The answer is who cares? Uh, if you're number two in social networking, it's like, you know, one hand clapping. If you're number two in search engines, you're like the proverbial tree in a forest that falls and nobody's there to hear it. So that's very different. It's very different for people to kind of get their heads around that. So what, kind of what's the role for kind of Canadian companies in a world where if you're not number one, you probably in some industries don't even matter. So where should we be focusing? I know it's a big question to start us off, but I, I'm really intrigued by this notion of winner takes most. So uh, I'll jump in here. So the um, first of all, one can observe that um, the data-driven economy, knowledge-based data-driven economy, nonetheless is contestable. Uh, recall when Yahoo was the big thing, when it, you know America Online was the big thing. This been remember when MySpace preceded Facebook. So it is a winner-take-all economy, and it creates temporary monopolies where number two really doesn't matter. But nonetheless, it's a contestable space. Today we have a new products like TikTok suddenly emerging from almost nowhere and then gathering massive uh, amounts of market share. And Shopify, as you mentioned, is a really new kid on the block and yet has gone to global dominance. So it's still a contestable space. And we sh and the key, the key thing for Canada is to maintain that uh, um, cohort of startups with brilliant new ideas, but then we have to really get on, on the uh, behind them and scale them up. And that's 
where our shortcoming has been. So I think we can forge a spot in this economy and, and recognize that uh, 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 you know this. this Bob. <laughs> Uh, I uh, missed the last part of what Dan was saying, but perhaps it was along the lines of, you know, Shopify is a great example because uh, they saw a market niche and uh, they exploited it. And, you know, and it's provided profound, uh, profound benefits to uh, a lot of the companies that in Canada, that, that Canada can actually use, Canadian SMEs can use to help them scale as well. So it's a really good example. I think the other issue uh, is the importance, uh, you know, we've talked about the importance of intellectual property and that these firms, as they scale, they also protect their IP and make sure it's not given away inadvertently or via other means. And that's an area that's typically been weak in Canada. Uh, I know that the Canadian Patent Office has uh, launched an education program. CG's done this in the past to try and help uh, co companies really understand the nature of IP, the importance of IP, and provide the technical advice for them to, to keep that IP. That's great. Uh, for those of you watching along, uh, you can ask questions. There is a button on the top right hand of your interface where the hand is raised. And if you push that, uh, you can ask your question and uh, they'll get fed through uh, and we'll answer a few questions uh, at the end. The second is, um, I want to talk a little bit about jobs and these platforms, one of the characteristics of these platforms is they don't actually employ a lot of people. And if you think back to, you know, the giants of the past, of the earlier kind of industrial or the tangible era, and you talked about a General Motors or a Chrysler or an Imperial Oil or an Exxon, they employed hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. And you look at Uber, and Uber, um, with the pandemic, uh, cut a quarter of its workforce. And a quarter of its workforce was only 3,000 people. And Airbnb also recently cut a quarter of its workforce, and a quarter of its workforce was less than 2,000 people. So these massive companies with multi-billion dollar valuations have, uh, relatively speaking, no jobs. So where are we going to be working in the future as, as a public policy analyst and as somebody trying to guide Canada through these dirt, turbulent waters, what would you tell the public policy analysts here to advise their ministers? Because we're, we're always taught or we've been taught through kind of school and through our careers in the government of Canada that you need, you know, the ribbon cutting ceremony and you need, you know, the, the, the sign and the X number of jobs, but when an Amazon and a Google and a Facebook come into town, sometimes actually they don't create jobs and sometimes they even take away the local jobs. What are your thoughts on that? I can jump in here with a first comment and then, then let, let the Bob finish up here. Um, but I would say that first of all, uh, trade economics tells us that human beings will have their comparative advantage, okay? So there will be jobs. However, the share of income going to humans has got to decline because as machines increasingly uh, take over, I mean, we're talking artificial intelligence or what I call machine knowledge capital, rents will have to go to, that, to, to the owners of those. And what we've seen over the past, since the beginning of the knowledge-based era, where previously the labor share, of, where previously the labor share of income was flat, stylized fact, it was flat. It's then started to erode, and as the deeper we get into this knowledge-based and data-driven economy, the smaller the share of labor income is. So, market will eventually assign jobs to people but they will be not so well paid and we will have an income distribution issue primarily as opposed to a jobs issue. Bob? Um, maybe I can be a little bit more optimistic <laughs> than Dan. <laughs> um, you, know, I, I, you know, our comparative advantage is our brains, right? Our, our ingenuity, uh, you know, our creativity. These are things that, that, uh, that AI doesn't have. 
And I, I like to think of uh, this new technology as complementing us. Uh, uh, and, and I think there's going to be a whole new set of jobs out there that we can't even predict today. There's jobs today that we didn't even know existed, you know, ten, that we wouldn't even imagine existing 10 years ago. But I do think Dan hit on a really important thing. And um, we are, like, you know, take, your, take the point she raised, Heike, that, you know, a lot of these people, well, not very many people were laid off comparatively uh, relative to what we might have seen in previous downturns. But, of course, it really has affected certain segments of the population much more than others. And, um, and this is the broader, uh, I think the broader issue is more uh, the rents that Dan's talking about and their distribution. And making sure we have a safety net uh, that, people can, that, that people can rely on. And we, you know, we've seen those gaps in action in this pandemic. They're not going away. Uh, we really have to think those through. I know the government is thinking those through. We've got to continue to think this, uh, to think about that. And you know, you know, going back to you know the creativity, the, the things that, that people are really good at. Well, is our education and, and skills training system set up to deliver that? Uh, it's an open yeah. question. I have my views, but uh, I'll <laughs> leave it there. <laughs> yeah, one of the things, uh, one of the things I always tell people who ask me about, you know, kind of how can I get ahead in my career and how can I be a better contributor to the government of Canada is I always say to them, you know, the only competitive advantage that you have today is your capacity to learn something faster than the person beside you. Because in, you know, when I started in the government of Canada in 1997, I was kind of valued for what I knew. Uh, but now, you know, when little kids from all over the world can walk around the world with the totality of human knowledge in their pocket, the relative value of the knowledge in terms of where it's stored is, is down to nothing. It's what do you do with that? How do you make it interesting? How do you tell a narrative around that? How do you link something that's disparate between A and B together uh, to make it something that uh, adds value as opposed to kind of just statically knowing a fact? Uh, we have a question now from um, from the audience, and it's a question that really touches, I think it gets right to the heart of the matter. You talked a little bit about the difference between the domestic and the international and how at, in some ways the domestic doesn't matter anymore, but in other ways the domestic matters dramatically. And... Uh, the pandemic has illustrated that very, very well. I don't think you would have ever, you know, more than two months ago, have, have imagined a scenario where the president of the United States is, is musing about putting troops on the Canada-U.S. border or countries are basically saying, you will not export masks or you will not export ventilators. So, you know, we were, we were coming together and then going apart dramatically. And the question from the, uh, from the audience really gets to this, and I'll read it, uh, because it's really profound in terms of as public policy analysts, what are we going to do? And the question is as follows. As a middle power country, how can Canada take steps to start protecting and benefiting from our IP without damaging our trade flows and cooperation from the rest of the world? And I'll put the question a little bit differently in a couple of respects. First, we're small, right? So in um, the world today, maybe the world from the beginning of time, it's the big people that write the rules, and we're not big people. So kind of number one, uh, what's our role as kind of a little person amongst giants? And number two, Canada, we always love to say that we are a middle power, and we punch above our weight, and we will work through international institutions. Is that still the, the path forward for our little uh, country north of the 49th parallel? Well, I, again, I, I'll, I'll jump in first. Um, first of all, on, on the um, sort of I'm prospering in this particular uh, economy, uh, we account for what, two or three percent of global GDP. Uh, we only need to capture about two, three, maybe five percent uh, if we're greedy, of the valuable IP. So what matters for us is that when we as a government fund research and development to develop a vaccine or to develop some other product 
that we don't wind up giving away that IP to a foreign country, that it resides here, that the owners of that IP who are accumulating the rents Bob, how about you jump while Dan's buffering? He, he, Microsoft acquisition of Maluba. Am I breaking up? Yeah. We got to get you. If you're on Rogers, we got to get you Bell. If you're on Bell, we got to get you Rogers. <laughs> Bob? Bob, you take over. Okay. Well, I, I maybe I'll go down a different road from where I think uh, Dan was going. And that is... Um, you know, actually, Canada has a very large role to play. You know, if you go back to the data realms uh, a slide that, uh, that I had put up, well, as I mentioned, um, all, most countries in the world actually don't fall in those data realms. Uh, we're subject to, to them in more than one way. Um, and um, I think a lot of those countries uh, that aren't in those data realms are actually looking for leadership. And Canada is well-placed to do that. We're a well-respected country. We have well, uh, we're well respected for our, our frameworks in particular. And if there's a place where a framework is just gasping for air, it is the digital economy. And, you know, we've got the brains. We've got, you know, we've got people developing these technologies that know these technologies. Uh, we have a great public service, uh, you know, at the federal level across the country. You know, we actually have all of the requirements to set the governance and export that governance. And as we export that governance, for example, via standards, we're embedding our technologies, we're embedding our values. It, so uh, Canada, you know, there's this enormous opportunity for Canada. And, you know, I think what we're trying to do at CG is encourage Canada to do it, to, to take that up. Well, now I'm having uh, issues, and I can't hear uh, Taiki. The issues are my inability to press the unmute button. So uh, I'll go back to being kind of an old school, traditional kind of Government of Canada official from you know the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, and I'll say to you, oh, this is all very interesting, but you know this is this isn't really where Canada should focus on. We're resource rich. We have. You know, we're 2% of the world economy and less than 2% of the world's population, but we have a quarter of the world's fresh water. We have a disproportionate share of, of forests and resources and oil. And, and as a civil servant, it's my job to make sure that the extraction uh, economy continues to punch above its weight because we have been blessed with, uh, you know, an abundance or an overabundance of natural resources and as an official in the government of Canada it's my job to make sure that the tangibles economy uh, continues to punch above its weight how would you what would you say to that maybe I'll, I'll start with this one because it reminds me of a conversation that uh, that we had when we were talking to some people in the uh, in the government and um, I think the question kind of went you know we were you know talking about the intangibles economy and the question was well but all the issues, you know, we're fighting with the U.S. on right now, like it's steel, it's cars, you know, using national security. Like, like these, are the, these are the battles we're fighting right now, and you're talking about intangibles. Like, what's going on here? And, you know, the way I tried to, to frame it is that, one, you know, we need trade agreements like we've signed to protect our tangible sector, to help it get its scale. Uh, you know, the things that we've relied on in the past. But we need... We need a shift in policy towards intangibles because that's what's going to drive growth. And that's the way I think about it. We, we need to, you know, encourage what's there and make it better, but what's going to drive growth are these intangibles. And, you know, to take the oil sector or agriculture as examples, well, they're becoming data-driven. They're becoming intangibles. And, uh, you know, these data analytics that I talked about, well, they're helping drive growth in these sectors. So. The tangible is becoming intangible as well, and um, and we this this is the no, this is the thing that we've got to keep in the back of our mind as we look forward down the road. 
Uh, and, and these things are going to help improve the productivity of these sectors, hopefully lower their carbon footprint, and a whole bunch of other things as well. Dan? Mute button, Dan. Um, yeah, not, not too much to add to that. The one point I would make is uh, to recall why Canada uh, named its trade minister the Minister of Trade Diversification. We are a resource-dependent economy, but that those resources are essentially the same ones which the Americans also have. And when push comes to shove, they put the protection on. And so we need to really also uh, focus on diversification. And with uh, a lot of that's going to come from the new knowledge-based economy. Gentlemen, we're down to our last minute. What a wonderful, wonderful introduction to our new series. Uh, as I mentioned, a lot of themes for us to explore uh, during the next uh, eight, nine, ten sessions. Uh, intellectual property data, privacy, trust, uh, domestic, international. Uh, what a privilege and a, and a pleasure it has been to listen to both of you today, to, for some of us to reinforce some ideas that are uh, emerging, but for others to introduce them to uh, a new way of thinking, because a lot of this is very new to, to, uh, to Canadians and to public policy analysts and uh, it's important that we start understanding the dynamics or what of, of what is driving the economics of the contemporary era, but also, as you hinted at, the geopolitics. And I think one of the things that we're, we're noticing, I started off this session by talking about the story, the quote from, uh, from Yoshi, the historian, about how the pandemic is pushing the fast forward button on history that we are seeing the re-emergence of geopolitical considerations to uh, an extent that none of us have seen in our lifetimes. Uh, in the post-World War II era, the geopolitics have been going one way and we are now seeing them go uh, another. And how Canada navigates this epoch will define our future economically and otherwise for a long, long time. So Avexa, it was a great, great pleasure to host you today for the first in our series. Uh, thank you again, and we look forward to the future sessions between the Canada School of Public Service and CG. Thank you again. Bye. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Apologies for the quality of the audio. <laughs> <laughs>